we have a notebook in which we're going to code a neural network from scratch. Okay, so let's go to that. You can click collab. It's probably best if you do it, you know, on your own time. You should really go through this notebook. But right now for the next maybe uh, 15, 20 minutes, we'll just kind of go through it together <clears throat> and see see a couple of things. Okay, so the first thing we want to see is what the heck is a collab, right? So I link to a collab here. So Google Collaboratory, which is shortened as Collab, is a great product in the deep learning space. And it's, uh, it's free to use. It's a notebook interface, but there's things that are way nicer about it than just kind of a standard Jupyter notebook that you might've seen. And it can connect to a runtime that includes GPUs. So, Let's go ahead and unconnect to a runtime. Okay, so we have RAM. We connected to Python 3 Google Compute Engine backend. And uh, this instance actually doesn't have a GPU, which is totally fine. We don't need it for this notebook. But when we come to labs, we'll see how to get a G GPU as well. So you'll notice there's a table of contents that's achievable by um, basically adding a text block and then having headings. So if I say this is a heading two, it's under this, this, um, let's delete that. Um, so this is a heading one, so like a top level heading. And then everything under it, heading to, collab environment, and stuff like that also shows up in the table of contents. So this is really nice when you're looking to organize your work. So the first thing I want to just cover is like, what kind of environment do we get in a collab? And um, when we execute, oh, by the way, if you, if you want your collab to look like this one, just go to tools, settings, change the theme to dark definitely better than the light theme. And then I'm using Vim key bindings, which is kind of cool. I'm using four indentation width out of the 120 character ruler. I'm actually paying for Colab Pro, it's $10 a month. It increases the chance that you get a fast GPU. It lets you run the notebook for 24 hours instead of 12 hours. And, um, and I think there's some other nice things, but for $10 a month, it's a, it's a, I think it's a really good deal. Hey, Sergey, can I interrupt you for a second? Please. Uh, is there some way for you to zoom in a little bit? Yeah. Is this better? Yeah, I think that's better. I'll, I'll let you know if, it, if it's an issue. Okay. And, um, okay. So, a collab environment. So, when I say plus code, it adds a what's known as a cell. And this is a Python notebook. So, I can type Python code this, I can execute it by pressing this run command or just pressing um, command enter. And when I execute it, it executes the Python code. Okay, no surprises there. I can delete this cell. Now, if I type a command preceded by an exclamation point, then it's actually not gonna be executed as Python code, it's gonna be executed as a shell command. So here I'm actually executing this just as if I was executing it in a, th in a terminal, right? So Colab runs Python 3.6.9, which is like three years old at this point. Um, we can see what packages are installed and it's quite a lot of packages. So what we can do is we can grab for TensorFlow and just see all the TensorFlow related packages all the torch related packages. So there, it's all you need basically. Um, and then if we run NVIDIA SMI, it's gonna fail because it couldn't communicate with the NVIDIA driver, but that's totally okay because we can run it without the GPU. But if we wanna run it with the GPU, we can go to runtime, change runtime type and request the hardware accelerator. So let's go ahead and do that. <clears throat> 
we see that it's connecting to another instance. And now we can, um, if, you, if you had some computations here, you'd have to rerun them because we just reset the notebook, but we didn't, so we can just run this. And so now we have a sweet V100, one of the fastest GPUs you can get anywhere. And we uh, are getting it for free for 12 hours now, or me for 24 hours. You would get it for 12 hours if you didn't pay. So first of all, we're gonna code a neural network from scratch. But before we do that, let's just remind ourselves of how numerical computing works. We're gonna use NumPy, which is the Python you know, package for numerical computing. Let's make an array of three rows, two columns, and all zeros, okay? So here we go. It's a ND array, three rows, two columns, and they're all set to zero. By default, the data type is float 64, so 64 bit float. If you say x.shape, that prints a tuple saying, you know, rows, columns. Um, we can set values of a whole row. So we can say x at the zeroth row and all the columns should be one. And if we do that, we can see that it, it did it. We can set values of an entire column in the same way, just via indexing. So we just set it to two, so now it's two. Okay, let's make uh, an X that just says one, two, three, four, five, six. <clears throat> we can take this matrix and then we can take a vector, right? So X is just going to be, let's initialize this X, no, well, So here I'm making big X is a matrix, a three by two matrix. Little X is a uh, two by, it's a two vector, right? A vector with two numbers in it. And so we can print the shapes. Now I can say X plus X, right? And so NumPy and PyTorch do what's known as casting. And so they try to kind of understand what you mean by that, right? Well, if the matrix is three by two, and your vector is of size two, well, you probably want to add that vector to actually every row, right? Because there's two numbers and there's two numbers in each row. So you just want to add it to every row. That's what it perceives you want to do. And that's known as uh, dimension casting. We can also do the same thing with multiplication. So we can say uh, big X times little x and that will actually multiply it in the same way. So it'll take the two numbers and then multiply it every row, right? And you can also do matrix multiplication, which is what we all came here for, right? And uh, there's two ways to do it. P Python from, I think Python 3 has this at matrix multiplication operator, which is quite nice. Or alternatively, you can say uh, np dot dot or torch dot dot you know, X and then your vector. Let's go ahead and do that. If you have, you know, any questions about matrix multiplication. So let's say we're doing a three by two matrix and we're multiplying it by a two vector. So what is that actually going to do? It's going to take that two vector, multiply it with the first row, add the result, I'll put it second row, third row. And so what we get is a three by one. So matrix math um, is going to be very important for deep learning. You won't, you know, unless you're implementing your own network, which we intend to right now, you don't have to think too much about it, but it's something that should really be, you should be comfortable with. Another thing that's um, very useful is indexing. So let's say we uh, generate just a random array, a three by two random array, right? So three rows, two columns, random numbers between zero and one. So now let's get a mask, this, a mask of all the elements of this matrix that are greater than 0.5. Well, we can use this mask to index the array 
So for example, everywhere that's greater than 0 0.5, we want to set to one. We can just do it like this. So we don't have to write a for loop or you know, anything like that. We just do this kind of operations. Lastly, um, let's talk about plotting. So we're going to use matplotlib. That's the main plotting library for scientific computing in Python. Let's make a random 100 by 100 matrix and just show it, right? So it looks like this. The color bar shows us that it's values between zero and one, zero being black, uh, white being, or one being white. And then it's just kind of this like salt and pepper noise uh, because we just used rand. We can also plot functions. So we can say X is gonna be um, just linear between zero and 100. And then um, Y is gonna be some function of X. So X times five plus 10. So this is a linear function. And then we can plot X and Y. And we can say, you know, put X's where the um, X, or yeah, put X's where X values are, and then connect them with a line. So we get this line. So the next thing we can do is go back to that, you know, linear regression example that we saw in lecture. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna generate 50 data points of one dimension. So X is one dimensional. And this is how we do it. So we generate values between negative one and one. And there's gonna be 50 of them. And each one of them is gonna be just one dimensional, which just means it's one number. Then what we're gonna do is we're going to set the true weights and bias. So like this is the function that we seek to recover. The true function, right, is y equals five x plus 10. So we set weights to five, we set bias to 10. And we generate the true um, values. So it's gonna be x, which is a matrix of n by one dimension multiplied by these weights plus the bias. And so let's look at all the dimensions. Let's look at the shapes of these things. So X is 50 by one, weights are one by one, bias is just one number, and then Y is gonna be 50 by one, just like X. And we lastly plot this. So the X's are the data that we kind of sampled and then the what we're plotting is like the true underlying distribution. And so what we want to do now is basically code a linear function that will initialize with some random weights and then just see how it looks next to the true function. Okay. So we say class linear and in the init method, um, we give it num input, so that's the dimensionality of the input data, num output, that's the dimensionality of the output data, and we generate weights. So weights transfer us from input to output, so their dimension must be input by output, which for us is just one by one right now. And we um, are gonna sample them randomly from a Gaussian distribution, and then we do some fancy initialization stuff that you'll read about, you don't need to worry about it. And we set a bias to just uh, zero for now. And when we use this function or this, this class, um, by the way, when you implement this, this call, special underscore, underscore, call, underscore, underscore method, that lets you say, you know, linear is an instance of this linear class, and then you can use it as a function. So you can say linear of X, right? And all it's going to do is take X, multiply it by self weights, add the bias. So this is random initialization. Let's see how it did. Not so hot. If I run this again, it'll, it'll show me a different, um, you know, it's always getting initialized randomly. It's always going to be down there around zero though, because it's initialized from a Gaussian distribution that's, that's centered on zero. Okay. So now let's code a loss function.
So we're literally coding a neural network right now, right? So we coded this, which is what's known as a fully connected layer, basically. Now we have to code up a, a loss function. Actually, continue with GPU. So the loss function is going to be mean squared error. It's going to take the predicted values of y and the true values of y, and then it's going to return uh, y true minus y pred squared, and then the mean of that. So that's mean squared error. And the initial loss right now is 96. Okay. Next up, we're going to add back propagation. So we're going to use gradient descent to learn the weights and bias of that linear class that we wrote. And so what we need to do is we need to compute the gradient of it. Okay. So the first place we need to add a gradient is the loss function, mean squared error. So this is how you call it, right? That's how it does its computation. And this is how it's going to do its backwards pass. So it's going to compute its gradient and return it. And the gradient of this function, right? It's y prime minus y true squared. Well, the gradient of that is two times y prime minus y true. And since we're also taking this mean, we'll um, divide it by the number of examples because we're taking the mean here. We have to account for that in the gradient. And the linear class Remember, it's random weights, random bias. To call it, we just do this matrix multiplication and add the bias. And then we think, all right, well, what should the gradients be? Okay, well, it's y equals w times x plus b. The gradient with respect to x is w. That's easy enough. The gradient with respect to w is x. And the gradient with respect to bias is just one. Okay. So the backwards pass is going to be us computing the weights gradient, the bias gradient, and the x gradient, um, x being the input. So the weights gradient is just what we were called with. Uh, multiplied by the gradient that's coming into it. So, so we're going to compute gradient on the loss function first, which will produce some gradient. Then we'll pass that gradient into the linear uh, layer, right? So it, the, the backwards pass takes a gradient from the loss function or from linear layers that are downstream of this one. And it just multiplies x by that gradient. The bias gradient is just, we sum up the gradient that we get in because it's just one. Um, and then the gradient for X is gonna be gradient uh, matrix multiply the weights because it's basic, the gradient with respect to X is W, the gradient with respect to W is X. So these are basically the same thing. We just do matrix multiplies in ways that make sense to them. And lastly, we code an update method, which takes a learning rate parameter. And all it's going to do is it's going to set its weights to the current value of its weights minus the learning rate, remember that alpha, times the gradient that we computed. And the same for the bias. And that is all it is. Okay. So now let's instantiate everything. And you know, let's make sure to run it. Let's take one step forward and then one step back and just make sure that it all works. Okay, so we compute the loss, we compute the, um, we instantiate the, lin or sorry, we instantiate the loss, we instantiate the linear layer, we compute the predicted Y values, we compute the loss of the Y values that were predicted against the true values, we compute the gradient of the loss by taking that backward step, and then we take a backward step in for, for the linear layer, which will compute the gradient for the weights, the bias, and the input. And then we're going to update with a small learning rate, 0.1. And then we're going to compute uh, predictions again with this updated linear function. 
and then we're going to print the loss. And so what we should see is that the loss goes down. So it did. We started with 110 and now it, it is 73. So we're in business and we can actually just train this function using gradient descent. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to plot um, um, x and y true, the underlying function that's going to be up here at the top. And then we're going to compute the loss or initialize loss, initialize linear. We're going to go for 60 epochs. We're going to go with a linear uh, learning rate of 0.1. And then during each epoch, we're going to compute predictions of y, compute the loss, compute the gradient from loss, apply that gradient backward, you know, backprop through the linear layer, and then update the linear weights and biases with um, the learning rate and the gradients that it stored. And, and what we're going to do is every five epochs, we're going to print the loss and we're going to plot it as a line on this um, chart. Let's go ahead and do it. And so what we get is orange is the zeroth epoch. So it's basically just nowhere close to the underlying function. By the fifth epoch, it's getting a lot closer to the function. By the 10th epoch, it's closer yet, and then it keeps getting closer. And then by epoch 55, the loss is only 0 0.01, and it's really close visually, okay? So that is um, that for one dimensional data. So we just coded up a fully connected layer. This is the entirety of the code for the linear layer. This is the entirety of the code for the mean squared error. And this is the entirety of the code for the training loop, okay? This actually just works for two-dimensional inputs just as easily. So let's get, generate 100 um, examples of two dimensions and a linear function on a two-dimensional input is basically just the same, except now there's two weights instead of just one weight. But in code, it's gonna be exactly the same. It's gonna be that matrix multiply. And in order to look at this data now, we have this plot3d function. So let's look. So this is the underlying function. It's like some plane in space, right? This is input dimension one, input dimension two, and then output dimension on the y-axis. We instantiate loss, exactly the same as before. We instantiate linear, this time passing two instead of one to it, because now it's two-dimensional. And then... Let's look at what it's initialized at. So this is the, you know, the output of this linear function with random weight initialization. It's not close to what it's supposed to be because we haven't trained it yet. So now that we're training, let's just make a function called fit. It does exactly what we did before. It goes for some number of epochs. And every epoch, it makes a prediction, computes the loss, prints the epoch on the loss, computes the gradient from loss, applies that gradient to the model um, in doing backprop, and then updates the weights of the model multiplied by the learning rate. Epoch zero lost five, epoch one lost three, two, and so on, and keeps getting lower and lower. And by the end of the training, our function is very close to the underlying function. And we can train it for even longer. Let's train it for 60 epochs. And hopefully we see that it gets, it basically gets it perfectly. Okay. Let's pause for questions at 7 p.m. So um, there's a question uh, that we covered a little bit, but I think it's maybe just worth reiterating. What, uh, so what auto differentiation library are we using for Torch? Torch. PyTorch. And then are you okay, are okay doing a uh, longer question that is um, not directly related to what you've been talking about for the past hour or so? <laughs> probably, no, probably not. Let's get through this. Okay, we'll save that to the end. Yeah. So we now have a way to automatically fit a linear function to n-dimensional data. And this is going to scale to n equals 1,000. It's the exact same math, exact same code. Notice we didn't change the code at all. We just we just gathered it together into this function, but it didn't change at all. And it's not gonna change for like a thousand um, dimensions. 
Where it does have to change though, is if we work with nonlinear data. So, so far we've been working with linear data. So it's either a line or a plane in, in three dimensions, right? But nonlinear data, let's look at two dimensions, for example, is going to be something that can't be represented as just one linear kind of matrix multiply. It's going to have to be something different. Um, so let's make some nonlinear data. Here we go. This is it. It's kind of like scoops up like this. So it's nonlinear. We can train, we can use our existing stuff to try to train it. It's just not going to work, right? So let's instantiate our loss, our linear function in D dimensions, which is two, um, and then fit it for like 40 epochs and just see what happens. So it trains, it gets, it reduces the loss and it, yeah, it, it looks better, right? Than just random, but it's just incapable of doing that curve, right? The best it can do is a plane that kind of goes through the middle of this curve. So in order to be able to represent the curve, we need to add a non-linearity, which we're going to use um, rectified linear unit ReLU, okay? This is the entire code of the ReLU. Um, to apply it, you just store the input. The output is going to be just basically the max of the input or zero, right? NumPy.clip, input or zero. By the way, in Colab, if you want to read um, a little, you know, doc string of some function, you can just hover over the function and just scroll through the doc string. You can actually even see the source of the function, which is really powerful. So that's quite nice. Um, so that's the forward step. And then the backward step is going to be the input gradient is, uh, for in places where the input was greater than zero, we'll just multiply it by output gradient because the gradient is one. And then in places where, um, it wasn't greater than zero, this will be zero. So it'll be set to zero. So it'll basically take output gradient, leave it as is in places where the input was greater than zero or set it to zero in places where the input was less than zero. Let's check it out. We have our ReLU, we can do an input. So this is the input 1.50, negative 0.5, negative one. And when we run it through ReLU, we get 1.5000. So it cut off all the negative numbers here. Does that make sense? And then the gradient of um, this ReLU, um, or rather, you know, what it's going to backprop is if we put the input back into ReLU, it'll just leave it unchanged in places where it was positive and then set it to zero in places where it was negative. Okay, so now how do we do a nonlinear model? It's going to have two layers, so one linear layer followed by a nonlinearity followed by a second linear layer. The first linear layer is going to take us from input dimensions, the dimension of the input, which right now for us is two, to the number of hidden units, which can be anything. We can set it to 10 or 100 or one or whatever we want. Then there'll be a ReLU. And then the second linear um, layer will go from the number of hidden uh, units to one because we're still doing regression and regression is just going to be one real valued output. In order to apply this model, we, so here we instantiate them. Here we actually use them. So we say X is our input self dot linear one of X. That's our um, L1 kind of, that's L1. We apply nonlinearity to L1 to get R. And then we apply linear two to R to get L2. And that's our output. Our backwards step is basically just calling backward on all of our layers, right? So we call backward on linear two, call backward on ReLU, call backward on linear one, and we pass each other's uh, gradients to them, right? So we get an output gradient from the loss function. We feed that into the backward function of linear two. We get the linear two gradient. We feed that into our ReLU. We get the ReLU gradient. We feed that into our linear one backward function. We get the linear one gradient, and we return that because that's our gradient. And in the process of calling this, all of these layers have stored their gradients, basically. So that when it comes to update, 
we can say, okay, linear two, update with the gradient you have stored, and then linear one, update your weights with the gradient you have stored. We don't need to update ReLU because ReLU doesn't have any weights, right? If we look at it, there's no weights that it uses. It just is a max function. That's all it is. Let's instantiate loss model. So we're going to uh, take input D and have 10 hidden units, okay? We output a prediction, we compute the loss value, compute the loss gradient, call backward with the gradient, and then just see what happens. Okay, so our loss is 132. Um, we're down here, we're quite far away from where we should be. We're gonna take one forward, one backward step just to make sure that our loss is decreasing. Because oftentimes when you're coding this up, you might you might like have a negative, you know, you might have a minus where you should have a plus or something. Just uh, it's a little tricky. So that's a good thing to do. Always try this. And now we're going to fit it. So we're going to have x, y true, our model, our loss, uh, our learning rate, and we're going to go for 20 epochs and just see what happens. So the loss is steadily decreasing. Okay, but it kind of tops out at 11. So I actually think I might have a bug in here. I feel like I had a bug and I fixed it. So let's just try again. Sorry, is the gradient of the rail loop supposed to return one if the number is positive? Because I think it's returning the number, but I might have missed Yeah, that's, that's the bug. That's the bug that I thought I fixed. Oh yeah, that's right. So, good, good find. Yeah. So what it should be is. Yeah, I can just remove the output gradient first. I'm not sure that's it. I just don't want to pass the output gradient through. Yeah. Multiplying by one effectively has to do if it's positive. I actually think this is right. Makes me wonder why it's not converging because it was converging. I bet if you open, if you open, um, if you open the link, you'll get my save notebook and it, it, it probably does converge. Um, so trust me, it does converge. There might be a bug somewhere and uh, I'll find it and fix it and, and post in Slack. But basically this is all the code that we need for it to actually converge. There's a bug somewhere in here, but it's, I remember fixing it like yesterday. I don't know why I didn't save in this notebook. Um, but now let's just do the same thing in PyTorch instead of our own code, okay? So it's gonna look very similar. So we're gonna have a torch model, which will inherit from torch.nn.module, which basically everything inherits from, and that gets you the auto differentiation. It's gonna take input dim num hidden. It's gonna have a linear layer, a ReLU, a second linear layer, exactly the same as our code. This is exactly the same as our code. This is uh, almost exactly the same as our code, except now I have these um, X underscore tensor because that's what Torch needs, right? It needs Torch tensors instead of NumPy arrays. So basically our X is a NumPy array. We just make it a tensor, but it's exactly the same. We don't change the value. We just, we just convert it to a tensor. And if we run it, we get um, this, just random initialization. This is the underlying function, same as we had, right? And if we wanna do the um, weight update, a good way to do it is to use the PyTorch optimizer. So in this case, we're gonna use stochastic gradient descent, which is the algorithm that we had coded up uh, before. It's going to be initialized with all the parameters of the model. And so this is like all the learnable weights and biases that PyTorch knows how to kind of find in your model when you initialize it. And with a learning rate of 0 0.01. We're going to zero out the gradients. Then we're going to predict, compute the loss, compute the gradient, and then take an optimizer step. So when you do this, that basically 
uh, back props, the um, it back props the loss grade. It, it back props the the from the loss all the way down to the beginning of your model because. PyTorch knows where your model was used, right? So when you when you when you called model with X tensor, it output this, and then we called loss with this, and that now PyTorch remembers the computation. It's able to backprop through it. So when we take a step, it's going to call backward and then and then call update with the learning rate. So it started 150 and then went down for, to 141. And then we can have a, a, a fit function, but specifically for torch, just like we had a fit function for our own model, does the same thing. And we're just gonna go for 20 epochs. Start at 141, 67, 16, goes, goes back up to 47, goes down to 14. Okay, maybe our learning rate is a little high, but it is learning this function. We can try to go for a little longer. And we can this one's actually not converging, so let's just reinitialize it. Okay, I'm not exactly sure why it's not converging to this because it should. And I think it did in my save notebook, but um, let's just press on for a second and see if this converges. So this is the same thing in now Keras, uh, or, you know, which is an interface to TensorFlow. So we just say our input's gonna be two dimensional. We're gonna have a linear layer, which Keras calls dense with 10 hidden units, followed by a ReLU that's gonna be applied to the inputs. And then we're gonna have another dense layer or linear layer, this time with one output, um, that's gonna be applied to the output of that first linear layer, having gone through the ReLU. We just initialize the model, print the summary, compile it with mean squared loss as the loss, stochastic gradient descent with a learning rate as an optimizer. And then, um, and then call this model that fit. So we don't have to write our own fit function here. It actually is provided for us by Keras. So let's see if this works. So we have our um, our, mod, our our network. And then this is the, we, we went for 10 epochs and it converged to something that's basically pretty close to perfect, the underlying function. Um, and that's basically it. So I'm very curious why these PyTorch things didn't converge, but I feel like, let me just really quickly see if I have a For those who opened it from this thing, let me see. Well, it's, I'm not sure. It was converging just yesterday when I tested it out. So I'm gonna test it out after class today because it's already getting late and then get back to you, tell you what the bug was, if there was a bug, or maybe it's just due to the weight initialization and like bad luck when you try to do it live. So um, I encourage you guys to go through this notebook yourselves on your own. It's not part of the homework, but it, I think it's good to have as a resource. Um, it goes together with the reading that we have to do this week, which is chapter two of this neural networks and deep learning textbook covering in detail the backpropagation algorithm. And I think really seeing code that goes with it, you know, with that theoretical knowledge is really helpful, right? To to me and to most people to actually like, yeah, I understand it. So go through the notebook, mess with it, um, try to like change a thing, uh, try to improve it. Um, that's it for now. Do you guys have any questions about the notebook?
didn't see any questions about the notebook. Okay. So then we could take a break. Or comments about uh, uh, changing the learning rate um, and, uh, and having that working. So maybe if you want to do a little bit of um, live hyperparameter optimization. Yeah, let's do it. So for a preview of what, what, uh, what your life will be like if you go to grad school for ML. All right, so let's go back to, um, so we have our data already loaded up in the, in the notebook state. So one thing that's annoying about notebooks, you can't quite tell what its state is, right? But um, that's, you know, that's a problem, but I, I have the correct X and Y loaded up right now. So what I need to do is just go back to, let's say PyTorch code and let's initialize that. And then the learning rate here is 0 0.01. And that seems to work. And the learning rate here is 0 0.1. So let's change this to 0 0.01 and go for like 40 epochs and see what happens. That didn't quite, didn't quite do it. Let's try, let's, uh, let's try one last time. Well, I'm not sure if uh, I'll look into it after class. I don't want to spend time right now trying to figure it out. It does work. There's just something about this particular save notebook that's like missing a thing. So I'll figure it out. Um, Lastly, it's 7.18 now. I really like to end it at 7.30. This first day is actually probably one of the longest, potentially, because we have two lectures, right? And a notebook and a lab. So I think steady state will be ending around seven, hopefully. But today we're gonna go a little late. Hopefully that's okay with everyone because we're gonna talk about labs. Josh, you ready for that? And you don't have to do anything, but does the Slack seem ready for it? Yeah, the Slack seems ready. I just want to make sure that we have uh, time for sort of broader questions at the end. Um, okay. Well, so 